All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Pooja. I am the president of the UCI ICS alumni chapter. And we just wanted to welcome you to the new 30 minute web series that we're going to hold every Friday at noon Pacific time. Uh, we wanted to just have this as an opportunity during this lockdown to engage our alumni and keep up with current technology trends. Um, and we'll be recording this so this can be available for replay. So please help us um, pass this word along to other alumni um, on social media. Uh, without further ado, I guess let's begin with Vijay Kumar, who is uh, alumni from UCI's ICS program, class of 1999, and he will discuss trends and opportunities in fintech. All right, thanks, Pooja. Uh, yeah, my name is Vijay Kumar. Um, like Pooja mentioned, I'm in class of 99. Um, I started just, I know you guys read um, my bio, but just briefly, um, I did I have experience with um, working at, at Unisys and in, in their research and development, advanced research and development program. Um, and I jumped careers and went to um, finance. Um, and now I work for a technology company who, who, who creates uh, loan origination and uh, loan accounting software. Um, today we have about 400 uh, lenders across the United States who are our customers um, and we specialize um, in small business administration or SBA products. Um, yeah, I'm on calls with the government or SBA on a monthly basis just to get their policies integrated into our software. Um, so you can, if you can imagine right now with the new CARES Act and PPP products, it's been a really busy uh, last couple of weeks. But um, I'm really excited to kind of share my perspective on fintech, what I've seen, and um, just kind of dive right into it. So today we're going to talk about fintech overview, um, just give you an, an idea of what is fintech. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know on the call what it is, but you have really kind of dabbled into it um, in detail. Uh, some of the trends and challenges that we're going to talk about, um, what I've seen, um, what's out there, and I'll give you some of my perspective on it. Uh, some of the prominent players in the market today. Um, and then I kind of put a little slide in here around uh, UCI ICS impact. I thought that was important because on a daily basis, I'm always kind of going back to understanding our foundation and what I've learned and how that's been applicable. Um, I would probably say that impact has been um, a lot more important, especially in this space. A lot of the um, banks that we've said I've worked with um, don't have really modern technology. They, you know, they, they try to, but, um, and they're, they're definitely getting there, but um, initially they, they have a lot of mainframe systems that they're working with and they kind of wrap that in with, um, with some of the, they wrap that in with, with some of the new technology just to, ha as, a, as an initial fail safe, um, as a temporary solution. So um, that does definitely cause challenges um, in this industry there's a lot of monolithic uh, systems being applied. Um, and now with FinTech coming in, um, there's a lot of disruption going on. And so there's, there are a lot of challenges I'm even facing on a daily basis um, as working with both sides of the house, working the banks and the other FinTech integration partners. So what is FinTech? Um, FinTech um, is basically finance meets technology. Um, and one thing I've seen is um, there's always this struggle between having um, these technology platforms work by nature if they're business to business platforms. Um, and uh, they're, they're typically B2B platforms. But um, as we're kind of growing in this industry, we're definitely seeing a B2C, B2C concept as well, where um, the companies like Acorn or, or Benmo, as you know, are working with consumers directly to, to fill the space. And that's definitely causing a disruption with. Um, the lenders, um, the Bank of America, the Chases, um, and also um, some of these other non uh, non bank lenders who are coming to the market as well, trying to try to take on some of this demand. Um, the the interesting part about this area is definitely uh, distributed transactions. I'll probably get into that in a little bit. Um, that's with um, we've seen we've seen Bitcoin, we've seen um, and we all, we've also seen. Um, uh, blockchain as a as another uh, trend that's coming into this market. Um, one thing I've seen is, and I'll talk about some of these trends, is my focus is kind of more on digital banking, 
Uh, that's what I've been doing for, for the last uh, seven years in this space. Um, before this, I was actually working at a bank. I was working at Lehman Brothers. Um, I know there was a kind of a, a, a stigma uh, associated with that, but um, it, I, I definitely learned um, the hard way. And so um, I, I, I definitely work with kind of the, the, the New York office on the reporting side. And I also work with our local office, just trying to get technology to be implemented into, um, into our, our model. I would probably say um, from a trans standpoint, the, the theme here is uh, scalability. Um, today with some of these uh, lenders or in, in this space, um, you know, they're originating loans through, they were originally loans through Excel spreadsheets. And now um, that kind of went by the wayside. And now they have core systems that the data is going into. And those core systems are feeding data into Salesforce and, um, you know, Oracle and IBM's big data frameworks. And so, um, so that's one piece of it is just the management of the data itself. The second piece that's probably more important is the process. I would probably say on, on a daily basis, um, I'm working with um, CIOs and CEOs and project managers just to try to understand the process itself. Um, everyone wants to automate as quickly as possible, but at the same time, we're seeing problems with that because not everything is spelled out during the automation process. And so we're going back and trying to figure out how can we reconcile some of these problems? Who are, who's actually holding onto the process? Who's doing the data entry? What can be automated? Um, can we add bots into the process? Um, and, and bots is, you know, to me, it's kind of thrown out lightly. And, um, and, and the reason why is because, you know, we, <laughs> there's two pieces to this. One is just providing the intelligence around the process itself. Um, so for example, if you have a deposit that's coming in, um, how, where is that deposit going? What general ledger accounts is that entry going towards? Um, and, and then how is that, and, and ultimately how is that transaction um, monetized and reported on? And um, across that flow that I just mentioned, there could be four or five systems that you're working with. And so um, from, a, from, a, from a computer science standpoint, it's really important to understand the big picture um, I, I, can, I probably can say that enough. It's, it's, it's a matter of um, understanding the larger picture and then figuring out how you can slice that into, into individual parts. And so those individual parts kind of make up this framework here where we have reg tech, payments, digital banking, investments, uh, crowdfunding, um, like, you know, and, um, and then kind of P2P or B, B2B lending sites, and then finally blockchain. I think blockchain today is really making its way into this space with distributed transactions. This is going to be really interesting um, in the next coming years, in, in my opinion, because um, as these partnerships grow between these financial organizations, between our government agencies, and between these, these disruptive partners we're seeing in this fintech space, we're definitely seeing um, security um, be at the utmost of precaution. Today, regulatory and security um, is, is causing the main bottleneck in this process and blockchain should solve that problem, in my opinion. Um, and so once you have a set of transactions that are all connected at the hip um, with these security um, identities, that's where blockchain really speaks volumes. But the problem with blockchain is the adoption. Today, um, a lot of digital banking partners have their own process to manage um, their, how they want to do their business on a day-to-day -day basis. So as soon as there's some type of regulation in place, that's where blockchain will start um, taking on a new form. And so I think adoption and regulation really go hand in hand to make this technology happen. Um, in terms of other trends I've seen, um, I think one other trend is, um, just kind of big data. Um, as, as these portfolios grow, um, we're definitely seeing larger amounts of reporting. I know in the healthcare space, this is definitely an, an issue with, um, with, with electronic medical records. And so all that data is being sent out to um, various institutions and um, various providers to make sure that that data does make sense. And we're using things like MongoDB to 
um, retrieve that data and get metadata out of it and so we can actually report on it. And so that's been a large, um, you know, uh, technology that we've been working with, uh, at least in, in my, my, my company um, and other banks nationally. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, the challenges that I've seen um, have, like I said, been, been around business process reconciliation. What that really means is um, today uh, there's definitely silos in these various departments. They do their processes however they want, and those silos are, um, and then those silos are actually pushed up to middle management and executive management. And um, it's it's a matter of understanding what the business process is today, and what the management team really wants to achieve as part of this automation that we're trying to put into their systems. Um, Legacy systems versus modernization. I think, um, like I said earlier, a lot of these banks um, or these insurance vendors or investment companies we're working with have legacy systems, and you know they're on these mainframes and um, these they're on the AS400 systems that um, just aren't don't have the capabilities. And so there's emulation going on. There's um, to create endpoints um, to make sure that you know, this data can be extracted or or preserved um, and then that data is somewhat being modernized and so they're adding salesforce on top of these endpoints to make sure that this data can be used appropriately um, but now that causes performance issues that causes uh, bottlenecks down you know um, down the road as soon as the core system is changed so there's definitely a side effect from these legacy systems that are definitely impacting our day-to-day -day lives today not all consumers see this, um, but once you're in this space, it really does provide a problem with implementation um, and scalability. I'm working with something right now with um, the Small Business Administration where, as an example, they're using XML and I was anticipating them using a RESTful service. And so now, obviously, those two technologies don't work hand in hand. And so we have to go back and kind of change our architecture a little bit. To, to manage that process and automate that process. Um, so there are struggles um, and just to kind of under that, that technology definitely impacts the process itself. And it also impacts our implementation around the efforts um, to make sure our clients are um, under, you know, are, are, are working with, you know, the best technology out there and, they're, and they're, we're, we're actually providing some of the automation solution for our clients. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking fast. I can probably go on and on about these. I know we only have a few minutes um, in this um, learning um, forum, but, but um, I think it is all very important. Um, in terms of um, one thing I did want to talk about and kind of hone in on is something about to tokens and tokenized transactions. And I know we all kind of know, um, you know, we work with Apple um, with, our, with our iPhones and we have Apple Pay and we're, we're, we're sending Venmo requests from one person to another, and that's great. But does, you know, it, it, once you kind of dig, dap, dig down and understand how um, those payments are actually being pushed from one person to another and, and making sure the security around them, I think that does speak volumes. And so basically when you do make a payment um, from, from you to a merchant or another consumer, um, that data does go through um, some type of merchant account, which eventually goes into some type of payment gateway. Um, and then the, the, the person who's actually acquiring that data um, will pass a token from one person to the, to the other to make sure the handshake is secure. Once that, uh, secures the, once that security handshake does happen and the token is uh, uh, authorized, um, at that point, um, that token does get sent with some metadata back into the institution to get uh, applied um, to the ledger itself. And then eventually there's um, a request that gets sent back to the consumer as well as the payment gateway to record that transaction. And so this entire process that we're talking about here um, is really important because as soon as, if one of these pieces breaks during the middle of this process, you know, our entire lives are at risk. We are, and these are our accounts that we're, we're managing. And so this network or this model has really been um, important in, you know, how we're managing um, our day-to-day -day lives. And I think I just kind of want to bring this up because 
we are at a point where this modernization, this technology is growing on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, on one hand, there's this, you know, conception with fintech where we think everything is modernized once you have, once you work with a fintech company, but the fintech companies are working with these um, archaic legacy platforms that have to have another layer, another middle tier layer on top of it to manage these processes. So there's always back and forth um, process going on just to understand film technology and how to make sure that this type of framework actually applies to our, um, our implementations as, as computer science engineers. Um, some prominent players in the space. So we have Venmo, as you guys all know. Um, I, I've been working with Stripe for the past year or so um, around the payment gateway. Um, one thing with, you know, one thing with some of these customers, just kind of understanding what their uh, fees are and how do those fees affect the bottom line for your margins. Um, you know, that's always something I'm thinking about um, because you might spend some time just to try to get automate something and you have a margin around it. And then all, and all of a sudden, once the implementation goes through, um, that margin is taken away from these third party vendors. So it's really just understanding how you can go back and kind of understand your sales or marketing tactics to make sure your implementations are right. So at the end of the day, you are getting some net profit out of it. Um, hey, VJ, it's Pooja. Um, is there a way you can press F5 and go into uh, full mode? Sure, no problem. And if you can, maybe turn on your video. Oh, sure. Work. You bet. Thank you. you bet. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. And then I'm sure my video on. Yeah. So, so VJ, we're, we're actually seeing the speaker notes. So I don't know if there's a oh. swap, swap displays. Sure, no problem. Might be under display settings. I don't know if you can swap it so that you'll end up sharing the, the full slide. Sure, no problem. One second. Let me stop sharing real quick. One second. Is that better? That's great. All right, great. Sorry, Sorry about that. So, um, let me go back a slide. Um, so some of the prominent players in the market, we have Venmo, who has a monetary exchange platform, as we all know, on a daily basis. We also have, we also have um, Stripe, who I've been working with. Um, we have some Peaceful Solutions, which is my company, um, or I'm one of, the, one of the managers in the organization. Um, I've worked with Peaceful Solutions um, for almost 15 years. Um, I was a customer of theirs for about seven years or eight years. And then um, I've been uh, working for them for almost the last seven years. Um, and, and, and what we do is we actually just provide um, SBA loan origination, loan servicing systems um, to the lending community. Um, we have Twilio, I, I work with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also Callfire in this messaging service space who are alumni from UCI as well and some close friends of mine. Um, we have we also have Auth0. Um, authorization is, to me, is really important topic in this space. Just understanding how, um, like I mentioned earlier, the tokens are working with one another and how those tokens are being managed. Auth0 manages that in the entire token authorization process um, and also provides a, a handshake between you and um, your, your Active Directory connections or some type of federated network that needs to be validated as part of the, that authorization process. Um, but there's, there's definitely other authorization or OAuth providers out there that you guys could work with. And then last but not least, um, 
I want to talk about kind of some of the impact that my comp the computer science curriculum at UCI has provided on me. I think um, some of the group projects that we worked with in lab and um, our junior and senior years, I think that definitely had a big impact because everyone has their quirks and everyone has um, you know, their strengths and weaknesses. And so just understanding the group dynamics behind some of these projects and how you need to use people to um, get the project done and delivered is very important um, in the day-to-day -day world. Uh, logic and critical thinking, just kind of going back to what I said earlier around understanding the larger picture, um, what is the best way to you know, manage a web service? Do you, you know, create microservices out of some of this and how does that actually play into the overall design? So there's a lot of critical thinking going on between your architecture <clears throat> and the business requirements of a project. Um, computer architecture and design, um, this is kind of goes without saying, just understanding the fundamentals Um, around your um, so the fundamentals around your your day to day work is really important, especially when it comes to scalability. Distributed systems. Um, I'm working with this on a day to day basis. Um, just integrations um, on it. You know, just understand what type of systems are out there, um, what those systems are doing, and how those um, systems are inf influencing or impacting your product and your company. Um, and the last is infrastructure. Where is your infrastructure today? What type of infrastructure do your clients have? Um, what are your uh, challenges of, of implementation and scalability on in, uh, infrastructure? How does cost, for example, when you're going to Azure, um, just, you know, do you get various app services? Do you have VMs that you're spinning up? Um, what is the cost of that process? Um, what does CPU utilization look like? So there's constant give and take around understanding what the impact is around your infrastructure. Um, this is kind of just some, some career growth options. Um, at least at our company, we're, we're looking for a software architect, um, database administrator, some uh, DevOps is really important on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, we're using DevOps today um, to kind of scale our company um, just from a, um, Container, we're, we're trying to implement containerization into um, our process, and we have uh, a need for managing the orchestration around those containers. Um, so that's always important. Um, that kind of goes into the whole microservice platform um, that is kind of taking off um, in our space today. And last but not least is kind of front end .NET core development. Um, we're using React, JS, Python um, to do some of our development today. So that's always beneficial. Um, in terms of some of the questions and answers, um, is regulation important to my specific business? And it definitely is. I think um, the, the, the one thing is, you know, I'm working with some of our vendors to help them out with um, SOC compliance or partnering with SOC compliance, just understanding the security behind someone's infrastructure. Um, we're also working with our customers on a day-to-day -day basis to put agreements and amendments in place so someone doesn't take advantage of us. Um, one good example was um, Zenefits. They're an HR um, fintech company that kind of dis disrupted this environment, but um, it turns out that they their, um, their customer service agents weren't licensed brokers um, to manage the insurance process, and, you know, just recently they were fined close to seven million dollars by the Department of Insurance. Um, uh, late last year. And so that does definitely provide an impact on the company as a whole. And so regulation is very important to, uh, to, a, to a business. Um, blockchain, that's another question that always comes up. What is blockchain? Um, like I said earlier, it's really just a matter of, um, it's a distributed transaction ledger. Um, and here, the, the main important piece of, to take away here is um, once the transaction is registered and recorded onto the ledger, that can never be taken away. Um, today, with the current process, once transactions are managed in a, in a general ledger or a ledger type of format, um, they might be managed in some type of Excel spreadsheet or they might be going up to, or I hope, I hope not, but they should be going up to uh, some type of um, refined database that someone's using or some type of core system that's managing these ledgers to make sure these payments are being applied correctly. 
And so once these multiple transactions are tied to the hip, there is more security around uh, the transaction for, for, for better reliability. Um, another question I kind of get is, can I build my future in FinTech? Um, you, you definitely can. I think my two cents here is, um, today there is this kind of uh, ebb and flow between these monolithic, just understanding these monolithic systems and um, just providing modern solutions to, to work with these monolithic solutions. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, if, you're, if you have patience, I think this is a good environment for you. Um, it's fast moving, but at the same time, you have to come up with solutions v fairly quickly. Um, and I think this week, the or in the last two weeks, the entire FinTech space has turned on a dime because just in an example with these SBA loans that we're working with, um, we were doing, these banks were probably doing five or 10 a day. And now they're doing roughly 500 a day with this new PPP program that's been put into the market to, for these stimulus packages. So um, literally in the last two weeks, I've been personally working um, night and day just to try to um, make sure these companies have some type of scalable solution to get implemented. Um, and um, last question is, what are the fears and frustrations of starting a FinTech financial services venture? Um, some of the fears are just kind of understanding your, um, your, your landscape. Um, who are the companies you're working with? What are the struggles today? Um, and why aren't they growing? What are the barriers to entry to make sure that that company is successful? So like we've talked about in this presentation, we have regulatory complexities, we have startup costs, um, everything from um, starting up your, your business and getting the right um, people and the best people to work with you to infrastructure costs and managing your uh, cloud services. Um, and then um, it's also a matter of just kind of understanding what is the backend infrastructure that you're working with, um, what infrastructure do you have in place, making sure that infrastructure is scalable. Um, and, you know, it's really a matter of just thinking big. Um, as soon as you kind of, it's really easy in this FinTech space to get um, stuck in the weeds. But if you understand the larger piece of this puzzle um, and just have, a, you know, a, a larger vision for the future, you'll do really, really well in this space. So. So, so Vijay, Pooja, we, we actually do have a couple of uh, questions uh, from the Q&A panel if you wanted to uh, um, handle those live. Didn't know if you, uh, if you wanted to, if we had time for, for a couple. Yeah, so let me uh, just step in really quick. Thank you again, Vijay, for um, talking about fintech. This is very informative. Uh, we wanted to try to keep this to 30 minutes, so we will um, have some time for this Q&A right now. Um, but if somebody needs to leave, I just wanted to thank you for attending. Please share on social media, um, ask other alumni to join. We will have a lot of interesting topics we are building the next few weeks out. Um, this will be ongoing. We plan to record them and share them also, but being live will be great so that you can ask questions and get involved. Um, the next event that we have will be May 4th for May the 4th be with you. Um, and we will have a Star Wars themed event with a game and uh, we will continue the Friday lunch and learns. Um, if we have questions, um, please, you know, please uh, put it in the Q&A section and we will um, go and answer them go right now. Um, Vijay, go ahead if you want to look sure. up. So, so the first question that came up was, cryptocurrency and um, it's not very secure and it's used um, by um, organizations um, that are, um, you know, organized, yeah, organized crime or, or money laundering organizations. And so I, I, it depends on how it's being used. Um, I think cryptocurrency is one piece, but I think blockchain is another. I think right now I, I do kind of agree that it's um, at the very premature stages, um, but I think from a, from a blockchain standpoint, I know it's a very controversial topic, but I think for the future in the next 10, 10, 15 years, this will take off. Um, and it's a matter of just having some type of uniformed platform to manage these, the security around these transactions. Um, and it, I, it, right now, it's just, it's very important to understand 
what are the nuances of a cryptocurrency and blockchain and just understanding how it could be possibly used for good in the future. Uh, the second question was, what does an authorization platform like Auth0 do? So there's a technology out there called OAuth and a few other um, authorization platforms. And what they do is, if you have a, a web service that you're managing today, um, or you have a client application that's using a web service, um, it allows um, partners to provide some type of plug and play uh, methodology. So for example, today I'm working with um, a third party like Salesforce who wants to integrate their platform or their APIs or web services into our web services. So we, need, we do need to provide some type of handshake mechanism for those two systems to talk. Auth0 and these authorization platforms provide the tokens to manage those handshakes. So there are, there are, there are basically client tokens that are being uh, implemented on the source and also the destination to make sure that handshake is taking place appropriately and with an OAuth type of platform. Um, and if you don't know what OAuth is, I would definitely read up on that. There's an o, there was OAuth and then there's OAuth 2 that's recently came out in the last year or so. Um, so what that is, is just a, um, it's a regulated platform by the industry to make sure your tokens are being managed and shared appropriately across uh, your entire um, uh, framework or, 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 or platform. Um, if there's any other questions, I can make answers as well, but those are two questions I got so far. Oh, wait, there's more, sorry. Uh, to the UCA panelists, will these virtual lunch and learn continues after the pandemic? I can answer that. Um, William, yes, if there is demand, I believe we will try to continue them. Otherwise, after the pandemic or after things get back to normal, we will maybe attempt to do um, one monthly online and then also a maybe monthly in person. We, we just started the chapter and we had a few events planned. If anyone came to homecoming, they w might have seen our booth. Um, and we're putting together a team, um, you know, some of which are on this call right now. So it will just be based on resources and um, the demand and if we can fulfill it. So yeah, if we get more and more feedback that people enjoy this, then we will definitely try to continue it. But our plan is to keep it up for the next eight to 10 weeks at least. I hope that answers that question. And then the last question was from Eric Smith any chance to see participants in future sessions? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll take that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll need to see what's what's available in uh, in Zoom. I know that we've been working with uh, the uh, Alumni Association as far as the, the, the technology and the format for, uh, for this, so we can see what options we have uh, to see um, if we can, um, if we can do that. But uh, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the feedback. Yeah, and I'll chime in. Um, we will try to publish um, the participants, uh, or you want to see the participants in the future, Eric, uh, or the next sessions, I guess. Oh, okay. I, I'll answer both parts of it. So we will try to have a calendar so people are aware of what the next couple speakers may be. So if a topic is more interesting, you know, you can chime in and I believe the next sessions we may try to go into a conference mode instead of webinar mode, right, Jamar? And that will help people interact with each other. Yeah, I think there were some some concerns about security and video bombing and things, <laughs> things like that. So, yeah, I think once we figure out those those sorts of things, and we can, um, you know, I think the more interactive. Um, um, you know, content, then, you know, the better, but yeah. We just you have the last the... slide, Jamar? The... Oh yeah, I do. Let me go ahead and share that. Um, I'm sharing. Okay. Yeah, let me go and share that last slide. There we go. So you can speak to this if you want, Jamar. Yeah, so um, I guess the, so next week is our next one. So I, I, I will actually be uh, speaking there. Uh, this is Jamar, by the way, um, uh, talking about um, how I've built a consulting business after UCI and just kind of uh, my career path. I know from a um, uh, from a career perspective, um, some of us may may be um, in flux, right? So, um, what sort of opportunities and sort of knowledge um, uh, can can we all share, and can I share as far as um, how I've built a consulting business, and and perhaps um, if you are looking to do the same. 
um, maybe that might be some value, uh, be of some value to you. And like what um, uh, Pujan mentioned, um, may the fourth be with you. We're looking to have um, a happy hour um, and game night. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that one. Um, probably a similar format and um, as far as webinar or uh, maybe just like a Zoom meeting based um, type of situation. Um, we've been looking at um, different um, online games we can play that's kind of interactive and fun. So that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. And Jamar, if you can just put the slide of our social media pages up. So again, everybody, thank you very much for joining. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week where you can learn about how to create an IT consulting business and the week after that for a happy hour and game night. So please email uh, UCI ICS alumni chapter at gmail.com. If you have any feedback, if you know a speaker or if you want to be a speaker, um, we have other engagement opportunities and find us on Slack, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Vijay, thank you very much. Your topic was very interesting. And yes, thank Mar, you. thank you for controlling all this. <laughs> no problem. Looking forward to seeing you all next week.